Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the launch of some very important research undertaken by uh, Swinburne and the voices of residents across our vulnerable community. My name's Amanda Murphy, Chief Executive of Connect Health and Community, and I'm joined by a distinguished panel of speakers and also those who are going to be answering our Q&A session a little bit later. Uh, I've got a message from someone saying they can't hear me, so let's just do an audio check, make sure there's nothing astray. Everyone hear me now? Terrific. Great. All right, so I'd like to commence this morning by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. For me, that is the Bunurung people. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend those acknowledgements more broadly to all First Nations people, members of the Kulin Nation. Thank you for joining us this morning. We have people from across Australia and overseas joining to hear about this very exciting collaborative research project. Four community health centres, Connect Health and Community, Star Health, Mary Health, Peninsula Community Health, and also through the support of our regional partner, Bendigo Community Health, Commission Swinburne's Global Centre for Health and Equity to capture the residents' experience during COVID-19 as part of the High Risk Accommodation Response Initiative, or as we refer to it, Hurrah. It was a unique opportunity to work with um, our vulnerable communities. And as a result of this partnership, we have a once in a generation opportunity to take action. For those who are unfamiliar with the Hurrah program, it was conceptualized in the early days of COVID-19 pandemic by the Victorian government. The aim of the initiative was to ensure that residents remained safe during the pandemic, to mitigate some of the anticipated risks for vulnerable communities and to ensure that the impact of COVID-19 was not unduly experienced by some of our most vulnerable communities across the state. The Victorian government recognised that the proprietors of social housing settings and the people living in this type of accommodation needed locally tailored community engagement and prevention activities to help them comply with the state's ever-changing restrictions and often individualised responses were required to support outbreak management and support residents during periods of isolation if testing positive to the virus. It saw our staff from not only the participants of the research, but all hurrah providers and our researchers working with residents living in high and low risk public housing, rooming houses, supporting accommodation services for people with disabilities, community housing, caravan parks and homeless hotels. The program became so much more than a strategy to manage the risk of COVID-19 in vulnerable communities. It would be remiss of me if I didn't mention the work and support of the many hurrah providers across the state at this time. We'd like to acknowledge and celebrate their efforts together with the five community health services who partnered with Swinburne on this project. Today, you'll hear directly from three of our residents living in a variety of accommodation across the state. Professor Richard Osborne will help us set the scene and provide context for this work. And Dr. Shandell Elmer, who led the work, will share the findings of this exciting research. Professor Richard Osborne is Director of the Centre for Global Health and Equity at Swinburne University of Technology an NHMRC Principal Research Fellow, highly cited global scholar and an advisor of the World Health Organization. Richard has led a wide range of national and international initiatives in recent times, um, projects including New South Wales Mental Health Literacy Development Initiative, a national study to improve resources for people living with irritable bowel syndrome, a Victorian program to improve breast cancer screening. He's contributed, he has an exceptional track record of innovation and impact. His research has led to more than 300 scientific publications, influencing both health policy and practice in over 60 countries. I'll also take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Shandell Elmer. Um, Shandell is, uh, le has led this research through what were unique 
and challenging times. She holds a PhD in sociology, is a senior research fellow at the Centre for Global Health and Equity at Swinburne U University of Technology. Shandell's nursing background and leadership of public health research is person-centred, impact-focused and in particular addressing the challenges of health and social inequities. Her expertise includes quality improvement and health service design, research and evaluation. She's facilitated capacity building, including frontline health service professionals and policymakers, both nationally and internationally. Shandell has led health literacy development projects, including co-design and production of multimedia resources for medication safety for Bhutanese communities, co-founded Health Lit for Kids, a primary school-based health literacy program co-designed and development of a pioneering quality improvement tool for the New South Wales Mental Health Commission. Working in partnership with Gippsland Regional Integrated Cancer Services to improve prevention, detection and treatment of cancer. Chandel, Richard and Ranjit, who is also from the centre. Uh, Ranjit is the manager of strategic research, um, knowledge translation and engagement. His role works with organisations and facilities to actually translate the research findings into practical operational um, uh, processes for our organisation. So Shandell, Richard, Ranjit and our project advisory group made up of the five community health services that were participants um, in the research project will be available to take questions during the Q&A time. We will endeavour to answer as many of these during the session as possible. If we have questions that we don't have time for, the research team will be um, able to respond to those by Friday of this week on a dedicated site that will be popped up in the chat. Today is about hearing the voices of the residents, both in our vignettes and in our learnings from the research findings. It's about finding a way forward from here listening to our residents, working alongside of them to support them in addressing their needs and co-designing strategies were key to building trust and delivering positive outcomes. We heard from more than 800 residents across the range of social housing settings. Our residents have a story to tell and it's time for that story to be heard. So without anything further from me, I will introduce one of our residents to you now who is living in high rise public housing. Stephen lives in an older person's high-rise public housing setting in Paran. Let's hear from Stephen. My name's Stephen Leishman. I'm 62 years old. I live in the um, Housing Commission Block of Flower Flats at Paran, right behind the Paran swimming pool. It's really good here. Um, you have the good um, residents, but they need to have some that are bad, but you take the good with the bad. The last two years of the pandemic have been an extremely hard time for me because when the pandemic started, um, one of my favourite activities was Joy Club. It was a weekly get together where residents would come, have something to eat, and they would play bingo. Joy Club is therapy for me. And to not be able to do Joy Club was extremely hard. The way I would normally access information would be through the Star Health person who has an office in the building. If we needed any information on stuff or we needed any help, the hub started um, in the foyers of the buildings. That was a, a lot of help getting information, finding out where you could get the vaccination, where you get testing um, and so forth. On a day-to-day -day basis, having the Star Health Hubs was a absolute godsend. Without it, I probably really would have uh, went totally crazy. So I'd come down, I'd sit and talk to the, whoever was on the desk. Um, I'd speak to them for like 15 minutes and I'd tell them how my day was going. The staff would listen to me and they would say if I needed any further assistance. 
So without the Star Help Hub, um, my, not just myself, but a lot of the other residents would have been in a really bad way. I am double, double vaccinated. Um, I've had no problems, major problems with having the vaccination. The first two doses, um, I had a sore arm for about one or two days um, and then that come good. So I would recommend um, people to get their boosters, get their fourth dose. Well, that was a terrific story. Um, Richard Osborne, and it's terrific to be able to present to you today. I'm just going to share my slides. Indeed, I understand that uh, some people are having audio difficulties. So we have a bit of a, we don't have a digital divide problem ordinarily, but uh, this is an important part of the research we found about the difficulties that people do have with being connected. So we have some small problems today. Hopefully most people are able to hear what's going on and hopefully it'll be fixed in the short term. But I'd like to take you through some introductory comments to the report. So the, the research we did was really with purpose. Our research questions was, what have people heard and what do they think COVID-19 control and vaccination means? What are the patterns of trust and information flow in communities? What are the people's preferred learning styles and types of media they use? What services and systems can community health services, the Hurrah program, put in place for diverse residents to enable them to be willing to be able to engage with COVID-19 preparedness and vaccine readiness. We really wanted to understand the health literacy background of people so that we had deep understanding of the mechanism by which we could then understand services and supports. So with these particular research questions, we really wanted to understand what community health services delivered in specific settings. And to two, to evaluate the experience of residents receiving support from community health services to determine the health literacy of residents specifically. Given two and three above, we want to evaluate from the perspective of diverse residents what worked, didn't work, in what circumstances and why regarding COVID-19 safe behaviours and settings. And five, to identify potential communications and engagement strategies that maximise readiness for COVID-19 outbreaks and uptake of vaccines. So this is a very much an action research, it's very practical. We really wanted to understand and support the community health services and the residents to actually make a difference in the community under extreme pressure of the COVID-19 pandemic, and also to have insights to take this research forward. And overall, to generate the recommendations, which you'll see at the end of the report about the implementation and continuous improvement and evaluation. <clears throat> First, I need to mention a bit about what really health literacy is. We have health literacy of individuals, that's their ability to understand, access, appraise, remember, and use health information and services. So that's really from the individual perspective. But that's all very well, but a person needs to be engaging with the health services. So the health literacy responsiveness of the services around a person is incredibly important. Perhaps it's even more important. But then, of course, people are living in a community. And it could be all kinds of assets around the community, the other residents that they live with, the kinds of community health services and the NGOs and the other kinds of services, the government policy uh, and different sort of environmental factors and safety in their community. And just having enough good people around them can actually inform them when they need some, some support. So health literacy is far more than just the individual, it includes the people and systems around them, the service around them, and the whole environment that people live in. But we do have a problem in a lot of work because when you do implement a program at the start, you have quick wins, but we would like to have complete and maximum impact on everyone. There's no more improvement in a, in a community at all. We'd love to get there. But as we implement programs, we have quick wins, large scale impacts. It's easy to reach those people who are easy to reach. You invest more and more and more and eventually as a plateau and you invest more and you just don't reach people because it's not potentially suitable for them. So 
This is typically a one size fits all approach that you just don't reach all the community. We can use health literacy to optimize and improve things, really understand how to improve the one size fits all approach, but that's still not gonna go far enough. We have to be really understanding health literacy preferences, you know, people's needs and take a strengths-based approach, understand and improve and, and build bespoke programs that actually wrap around people. So to do this, we've used the Ophelia approach, the optimizing health literacy and access approach. It uses health literacy thinking to connect people at all levels in a community in co-design, prioritization, and the implementation of locally designed fit for purpose solutions. So Ophelia is really about getting into the hearts and minds of people in a community, our best frontline practitioners, and our managers and policymakers to build programs. It has a whole bunch of eight principles. I won't go to these in detail, just to give you a flavor of the way in which we work. So Ophelia focus on outcomes. It's driven by equity. It's driven by local wisdom. We use diagnosis of the actual local needs. We use co-design approaches. We really seek to respond to the varying levels of health issues in a community. We apply it across the system and we ensure that every step of our work is working towards a sustainable program. I feel it's got three phases, but I won't go through this in detail. Where we've got to is about to phase two. We really understand what's going on in the, in the resident setting and um, in social and public housing. And we've got a very clear set of actions that can now be prioritised and implemented in different ways. So just to sort of wrap up. So we're also very interested in the difference or the importance of a top-down and a bottom-up approach. So there are a lot of problems with just the top-down approach. And this is one of the motivations for this research because there's a lot of top-down communication coming from government, even though there was quite a bit of tailoring, we thought there needs to be much more engagement from the bottom up. But when you do bottom up work and it's not connected with the government other processes, the problems can happen because there's a lot of disconnect potentially. What we're really interested in is both a bottom up and top down approach where in particular you have coherence between what the government, governance needs and what uh, policy is requiring. A lot of support for the coordinated meaningful engagement and implementation across communities such that we have policies and programs matched to what the community needs, wants and can implement. So that's every step of our work has been trying to get to this position here. So a program that's doable, needed and wanted. So indeed, um, Dr. Elmer will soon go through the eight uh, particular recommendations in detail. And so that's what's embodied in our report. So that was just my introduction. I'd very much like to go back to Amanda and get on with the, the meat of, the, of this study. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for those words, Richard, um, and resonate really strongly in uh, the work that we've all experienced supporting communities, particularly vulnerable communities, through the pandemic and the need to match needs and wants. On that theme, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the second of our resident voices, Raf. Raf describes himself as a Bhutanese leader. He'll find a word and he'll go and get um, a, a world view of that word. Uh, and so without further ado, let's hear directly from Raphael. My name is Raf, also known as the virologist. Identify as a middle-aged male, have a disability, an invisible disability, Asperger's syndrome, living in high density housing. All my things are around creativity ranging from writing to photography to radio. I've lived in social housing for over 10 years. It is the first time since I was a teenager I've actually had stable accommodation in the one spot for 10 years. With stable accommodation, it made my life a lot easier for myself because I actually had a permanent address. There has been a lot of challenges for me personally with COVID. Not only did my mental health deteriorate, I didn't have the physical outlets that I needed, which meant that my mental health got worse. I had some advantages which other people did not actually have. 
First of all, because of my creativity with Arts Access Victoria, we were using Zoom back in 2017, three years before people had actually really heard of Zoom, but we had already started using it. Secondly, from a disability culture and disability pride perspective, we have been doing the advocacy around trying to get people to be able to work from home if they wanted to for the past 20 years. And it took COVID to realise that people could actually do this and it was a satisfactory outcome. And the last outcome I have, that I do go to a 12-step program. The meetings were actually online and that meant that I would have a connection with the outside world once a day if I chose to and if I wanted to, that was good for me. I also did my best. This is the one thing that actually, we're down at Howley Park. It's in the city of Glen Ara. And this was important during the lockdowns. I could come out here because this was the only green space I had around me because where I live is a concrete building. This was my fresh air, my connection to other people. With the Hurrah program, I was pretty sick there for about a week and I've had all my vaccination. The help assistance that I got from the Hurrah program, I said, on the day that I went to get tested and the testing station was closed, I emailed Connect Health with an urgent request. And that's where the Hurrah program, they got it right at that point. They responded, Janice responded extremely quickly. We had a talk about this. I found out that I was COVID. Janice went out of her way. We had a chat and that was organised. I was very, very grateful for that. And the last part of what Hurrah did, I got a phone call with a health worker and I've got a lot of empathy and compassion for the actual worker. The person who was ringing me each day just for a conversation to check in, apparently they were isolating because of COVID as well. And I really felt sorry for them, but they were working through it. There you go. Technical glitch on my end with the muting and the unmuting. You'd think after two years, this would be just second nature. Sometimes the click's too quick. We all know that feeling. Um, once again, very powerful story from Raphael's perspective and um, the individualised support that Hurrah was able to provide to individuals in our vulnerable accommodation settings. I'll introduce Georgie to you now, who's our third um, voice of the residents this morning. Uh, Georgie lives in community housing in St Kilda and in navigating beyond COVID, she's hopeful of restarting her passion of nature photography, even representing her work at another exhibition one day. Let's hear from Georgie's perspective. My name's Georgie. I have a BA in Art Communications and I'm um, kind of like a really into photography and like capturing nature and stuff like that. I've lived in St Kilda now for five years but I have lived like pretty much all around Melbourne. It's been full on because like I do live alone so it was like it was really hard without the human connection um, even though you still did phone calls and FaceTime and stuff, but it still wasn't the same. Socially isolating. It's also the fact that like it's a tiny unit and it's just you. There's no garden, there's no space, there's nothing to engage with. You just felt a little bit crazy and didn't know what to do with yourself. I was one of these people that like I watched the news 24-7 at some point, which it's not a good thing for your health, but I did it for to get to try and find out the right information, what was going on. My truth is I have one of the best GPs in Melbourne. So like I just basically go to my doctor's clinic and talk to my doctor. I was really vaccine hesitant. And so I had to ask my doctor a million questions before I actually had it. 
I think it's just like something that had to be done. Like, like you know, like you need to protect the ones you love and the community. And for me, it was more about like, yeah, protecting the community than anything else. I went to a public housing site and it felt like a little bit like you were intruding and they set up because you had to go inside the foyer and stuff and it smelled really bad and um, it was just yeah it just wasn't a very good experience that I was just like I don't know if they should have been doing it like in a public housing building where people could walk through and yeah I don't think it can ever go back to before COVID, but like, would like to see more community access. I used to volunteer to do Reiki in the prison, that's gone now. There was a pay it forward shop that was like community focused and you'd go in there and you'd volunteer, you'd pack up their um, sacks for homeless people and you'd just go in and have a chat and um, that's gone. Um, yeah, I haven't got any work. Um, so yeah, so it's a bit trying to build up who you are again. Thank you, Georgie, and, and thank you to Raphael and Stephen and for sharing your stories. And uh, I'm you know, very privileged to have been part of this research project. Thank you, Amanda, for introducing us and also to Richard. Uh, today is really a celebration of our um, achievements, but more so of our learning. Um, it's sometimes difficult to find a starting point when people say, so what did you do? What did you learn? What, what, what can we do differently? Because there is so much that we've learned across the course of this project. Uh, so it, it is quite difficult to put it into words sometimes. Um, and on the subject of, of words, one of the words you'll hear me, I'll try not to use it all the time because I think that it's not always good to use jargon, but one of them is hurrah, and Amanda has explained what the hurrah program is. And it sounded strange when we first started using it, but now we use it all the time. And so if I use it today, please remember that it's about the High Risk Accommodation Response Program, but perhaps hear it also as, as a cheer or a rallying cry to action. The other word I'll use today is around our lead providers, and these are our fabulous research partners, Connect, Star Health, Mary, Pinchel and Benigo. But as Amanda said, there's also another, there were 26 lead providers of the Hurrah program across Victoria, so we acknowledge their work as well. So I'll just share my screen, so some slides to um, guide us through today. So as Richard said, there are eight areas for recommendation for within this report. And today I want to talk you through how we came to arrive at these recommendations and also share with you some of the findings within those. Importantly, as I said, we are celebrating our achievements, but also our learnings, because to have true social impact, we need to, to really focus on what we've learned and how we can uh, use this information going forward. One of the important things to remember is that while our research took place within the COVID-19 pandemic, what we found and what we now understand about how to work effectively for really uh, communication that works and engagement that works within these kinds of settings applies now even more than in the COVID-19 pandemic, if you like, because uh, people are still experiencing COVID, communities are in that process of responding and recovery. So we need to continue. And if not COVID, then there are always reasons to engage with people in the community to improve their health outcomes and equity. So I just want to take you back. I know Georgie, Raphael and Stephen have talked about their experiences during COVID and I think sometimes we need to reflect back and think about what it was. So ironically, this media release is from 16th of August last year, when we were just going into our extended lockdown. And from there, there were lots and lots of messages about COVID, how to keep safe. As Georgie said, many of us were tuned into the TV 24-7 trying to work out what was going on. The reason I mention this is because it's important because it impacted on the way that we were able to do the research. 
it also impacted on the resources available from our research partners, you know, their, their priorities and, and things that they had to do within this public health emergency. And it also created additional urgency for our findings and to share them immediately with the research partners so that we could put them into place as soon as we could. So with our research settings, and, and we, we started engaging with our research partners back in June last year. Our data collection took place between September and December. So that was during across all different levels and periods of public health restrictions around what we could and couldn't do. As you know, we have our, our fabulous partners that we worked with. And what we were trying to do was get a diverse range of settings. So within the Hurrah program, these settings were known as tiers. So there's tier one to four. So you had your, your public housing, medium, low rise, high rise public housing settings. The staff settings, which were the disability residential settings, unstaffed, which include things like roomy houses and private community housing. And then there are other settings, things like caravan parks, um, perhaps homeless hotels. But we were really trying to make sure that we had a good breadth of people participating from across these different settings and uh, people that aren't normally given the opportunity to participate in this kind of research. We also went up to Bendigo and worked, uh, engaged with some people in Bendigo, including people from the former refugee community, from the Korean community there. The way that we invited people to participate, and again, remembering that we had to do things that were acceptable within the parameters that we were given to work in, we worked with the research partners to develop postcards. The one on the left is the one that we distributed to invite people to participate in an online survey. So it has a QR code for people to access the survey. We weren't originally going to do an online survey because we're aware of the digital divide. However, we needed to get information and we needed to get it quickly. Uh, so we, we did this process. We gave people an opportunity to, to have phone support to complete that survey. So I actually spent time on the phone with over 100 people helping them to answer the survey. For the field work, when we could go out into the field, we distributed postcards to let people know that we were coming. You also see on the postcards, we provided people with a $30 supermarket voucher to thank them for their time. So we collected data from all different kinds of settings in terms of the field work that we did. And some of this was done in community rooms or as I said, we went up to Bendigo, fabulous. Um, we had as a pop-up vaccination clinic in the, in the temple. And there was also different hubs that we had uh, a presence at as well. Importantly, with this field work, we worked very closely with our lead providers. So we recruited, specifically recruited interviewers and trained them to undertake this field work. The training included staff from our lead providers so that they were able to tell the interviewers more about the, the field, the environment that they were going into. And also when the interviewers went into the field, they went with the staff from the lead providers and they helped them to find their way around to, you know, um, interact with the people in those settings. They also were able to, if, if issues came up that were outside of the research, they were able to provide that support to the community member. So it was very much a partnership in the way that we went about collecting, collecting the field work. So what happened as a response of that recruitment effort is that we reached over a thousand people not all of their responses were complete, so they were put to the side when we were doing the data analysis. We had 865 uh, responses that we could include in the data analysis. Some of them, you can see the breakdown between the lead providers and the different ways that we collected the data. You see in Star Health there that I've circled, there was a larger number of surveys collected in that 
uh, lead provider catchment area. And that was because Star Health started first. And we took time to read like complete individual responses to make sure that our survey was working in the way that it was intended to really get a feel for are we asking the right questions are people engaging in the survey that kind of thing so it ran for a little bit um, longer like a few more responses but we also received a lot of responses in a very short period of time so we received over 300 responses from the star health area in just 29 days the other area I wanted to highlight is that each week we would present to our project team, which included representatives from the lead providers, how we were going, how this recruitment process was going so we could target it better if we needed to. And we found that within Mary Health, the people who are living in supported residential services were underrepresented in the online survey. So we also conduct, conducted additional interviews in that area to ensure that those people had a voice within the research. So the way that we collected the data was through this online survey, face-to-face -face interviews, which also included some of the same questions that was in the online survey, but not all of them, and also provided us an opportunity to ask questions about health information and COVID safety. And also we presented all of this information to our four, four of the lead providers in action learning workshops, and we held those with community health staff. So what I want to do this morning is take you through some of the results to both show what we found, but also to help you to navigate your way through the report to know what's in it so that when you come to read it, you can think, OK, I can use that to learn about this in our community and put that part into action. So they're just little snippets of what we found to help you work out how you might use the information. All right. With the health literacy questionnaire, there are nine scales within that. And these are things, you'll come to know these quite well as we go through. They're feeling understood and supported by healthcare providers, having sufficient information to manage my health, actively managing my health, support, social support for health, appraisal of health information, ability to engage with healthcare providers, navigating the healthcare system, and the ability to find good health information and understand health information well enough to know what to do. So that was the mainstay of our health literacy survey. And we added to it two questions from the EHLQ, which is about digital health literacy. And two scales we added, one was about using technology to process health information. And the other was about understanding of health concepts and language. The other items that we included were questions about people's daily worries. What were they worried about? And then we added in some questions about people's positive and active engagement in life and emotional distress. And those questions come from the Health Edu Education Impact Questionnaire. So we're trying to gauge people's health literacy, their use of digital technologies, what they're worried about, and their, how they felt about their everyday life. So it's quite a comprehensive and broad ranging, in addition to the there's, there's demographic characteristics as well. So what did we learn and what kind of participants did we reach? So what we know about our participants is that just over half of them lived alone. We know that half were female, we know that a little over half were aged between 45 to 74 years, but that varied across the different catchment areas. For example, Star Health had a much younger group of people who participated, whereas it was a bit older down at Peninsula Health. Of those who indicated their sexuality, about 10% were sexually diverse, almost triple the estimated Australian average of 3.5%. Almost 40% were born overseas, with India and UK the most frequently reported countries of birth outside Australia. 24% did not speak English at home. We found that of our participants, almost 6% reported that they were Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people, almost double the national average of 3.3% and much greater than the Victorian average of 0.8%. Only 19.4% of our participants had completed high school, less than half of the Victorian average of 54%. Unemployment amongst our participants was 15.7%, and this was three times greater than the Victorian unemployment rate during the data collection period 
which was 5.2%. And the proportion of in receipt of a disability support pension was 8.5%. Which, more, which is more than double the rate for the Australian population aged between 16 to 64, which is 4.1%. So these kind of uh, characteristics help us to understand the, the struggles that people are having and also the challenges that may present when trying to engage with health services and health information. When we asked people about their worries, we found that most people were worried about their mental and physical health and their money. We also found that food insecurity was a significant issue for some. Of the 200 people that we interviewed, one in five indicated that they were experiencing food insecurity. We can see here that 70% of those people ate less than they thought they should because of a lack of money or resources. When we looked at people's self-reported chronic conditions, we found that amongst our participants, 70% of them were living with at least one chronic condition. When we compared these figures with the National Health Survey, we find that the chronic conditions were much more prevalent among our participants than the national average. Of particular note are the rates of depression and anxiety. Now we're going to look in more detail at the health literacy data. And what you see here is five scales from the health literacy questionnaire that have been compared with the national and Victorian data. And we were able to do this because the health literacy questionnaire is used by the Australian Bureau of Statistics in the National Health Survey. And what it shows us is that the health literacy mean scores for our participants are significantly below that of the national and Victorian scores. So if we take, for, so if we take for example, the lower mean scores for social support for health. So if you recall, I said that uh, just over half of our participants live alone. We also heard from Georgie, Raphael and Stephen talking about the difficulties around social support and social connection. So this thinking about social support as a resource for helping to manage your health, it indicates, again, another area of need and challenge and something that we need to address. So here we're looking at what we call the results of a cluster analysis. So in the previous slide, we looked at mean scores for averages, but it's really important that we get beyond these. So when we go beyond them, we see different patterns. So this cluster analysis shows us how people respond to the questions differently. A cluster is a group of people with the same answers to all the scales in the health literacy survey. So you see here clusters number one to 12, is the solution that we found, or the way that the, the clusters that we identified. The numbers in the clusters vary. Some are larger than others and some are quite small. We see the largest cluster here at number three, but there's also another big grouping at, at number 11. Generally, from our other research, we know that you know, around four, five, six is where we see the larger kind of clusters. So it is quite unusual to see a very large group indicating a high level of need. The chart's colour coded from green to show an area of strength to red to show areas of need. So if we just run that eye over some of these results from the scales, the first one is from the EHLQ or about whether people are using digital technology to process health information. The maximum score here is four. So we see that for a lot of people in across a lot of the clusters, perhaps with the exception of number one, that people are struggling or not using technology to process health information. Again, if we look at scale four around social support, the data we have here supports what we saw in the mean scores and also uh, people living alone is that Social support is another area of challenge for people. But we can also look at this graph to get a quick overview of what people's strengths might be. So number three is about actively managing my health. 
So for a great deal of people, they are actively managing their health the best they can in their particular circumstances. They do want to take an active role. Another area of strength is the ability to engage with healthcare providers. You see the mean score for scales six are quite good. Uh, the, the highest is number five. So we what that that's also consistent with the finding that 70% of our participants had a chronic condition requiring regular engagement with healthcare providers. So there are strengths as well as areas of need. The other area of strength perhaps is around people being able to understand information well enough to know what to do. So sometimes as a service provider, I know that I'm a nurse and we just want to give people more and more information, but perhaps that's not what we need to be doing. It's, it's, we need to look behind that, um, but also recognising that's a strength. So when we are working with community, knowing that they can understand the information and know what to do with that, it's the access to it that's perhaps the problem. So the other way to look at this to graph is to look at the clusters across the rows. So on cluster four, you can see how that builds to particular characteristics. These people have low scores around using digital technology um, and good scores around being able to, or strengths around engaging with healthcare providers. Another one that we'll take a quick look at today is number 11, where there are much more or many more health literacy challenges. But what all this tells us is that different people have different things that they're good at, different things that they like, and different problems in getting and using information to care for their health. So as Richard said, the key message is that one size does not fit all. We can think of these seven elements as key independent mechanisms or characteristics, if you like, the things that give us insights into why people do or don't or can't engage with health information practitioners and services. So we can take this even further then. Um, we, we created these health literacy profiles for each of our lead providers and they have their own set of clusters and own set of uh, resources to go with that. But this morning, I'm just going to show you a quick glimpse at two of these clusters, number four and number 11, and how we can build a picture from there. So again, going deeper into this analysis. So this is cluster four. So these are people who prefer engaging with healthcare providers about health and health, health information, rather than using technology. And we can see that from their scores. So the low score in uh, using technology and the high scores in being able to engage with healthcare providers and understanding information. So know the information they can do that. But remember I shared with you all of the different sources of data. When we pull all of that together, and there's a lot on the page, uh, but I've just circled some things that are key to thinking and understanding people in this cluster. So we know that they're older. We know that uh, you know almost 50% of them didn't complete high school. We know that about just over half are retired. We know that 77% are living on their own. We know that they're most commonly affected by arthritis. We know that a lot of them have been to see the doctor or a health professional uh, at least once a month in the last 12 months. And most for most times that's been their GP. And we know that they're pretty much their main concern is around money and also their physical health. So in order to present this data in a way that helps people to use it, so again, when you're thinking about using how you might use this in the report, you, we have all of this demographic information related to the different clusters, but to help people make sense of it, we turn it into a story. So this is a story about Marie. So Marie is a composite. She's not any one person. She's representative of that whole cluster. So Marie is 67 and retired, has lived alone since her husband died five years ago. She worries about money and making ends meet, especially since her husband passed. She lives on the second floor of a three-storey housing estate. She's got painful arthritis flare-ups that she feels mostly in her back, which restricts her mobility. It's a bit more difficult being on the second storey because of the stairs, but Marie doesn't really want to leave where she is. She likes to go walking, although she sometimes feels anxious about going too far from home. She sees her GP regularly for medication, has had two COVID vaccinations. 
she finds it hard to find health information and she doesn't like to use the internet or doesn't use the internet at all and resents that information is provided online. She often wonders why does it have to be so hard? She relies on her GP for information and gets confused by other information that doesn't make sense to her. She has a few friends on the estate but no close friends nearby. Her daughter lives interstate and she has a son that she has not been in touch with for a few years. So let's have a look at cluster 11. So remember, this is people who have far more challenges with their health literacy. And we would describe them as people who do not have sufficient resources to manage their own health. So these resources are around their social determinants, economics, about their health literacy resources, et cetera. So let's look at their socio demographics. We know they're younger. 40% uh, were born overseas. 40% didn't finish high school. But interestingly, this was the group with the highest level of people who completed a certificate or, or post-school diploma. High rates of unemployment and also a high rate of people working part-time. About half of them living alone. Really high rates of depression and anxiety. Very high um, rates of emotional distress as well with that. We see that um, people were going to see a GP, but particularly of no, she's given those high rates of depression and anxiety, only 6.9% of them had seen a mental health professionals. When we look at their worries, you can see that these are much, much higher than people like Marie and their mental, physical and physical health and their money are their primary concerns. So this is a story about Farid. And Farid is 27 years old and lives alone in a low rise public housing or he's meant to be living alone. He seems to have people staying most of the time. He wishes they would help with the rent or food, but people just seem to come and go. But he can't say no to people dropping around. His Centrelink payments aren't enough and he'd like to find a job, but his options are limited as he dropped out of school. Fred just couldn't seem to learn like the other kids. Fred's got a mobile phone, but sometimes he loses it or forgets where he put it. He runs out of credit and can't afford more. This means his access to online services like Centrelink and health services is patchy. Lately, he's feeling really down. Fred's early childhood was difficult as his father had been in jail and there'd been some family violence. Sometimes these early memories come back and he finds it difficult to sleep. Drugs and alcohol help him to forget. He sometimes loses track of days, but he doesn't know how else to handle things. He's really worried about his health and well-being and just can't seem to be on top of things. He doesn't know where to go or who to talk to, and he doesn't have a regular GP. Sometimes he worries it will be like this forever. So remember I said we turn the data into stories so we can use it, and the way that we use it is in workshops where we ask people, do you, do you recognise people like Fred in your community? And people go, yeah, I, I saw someone just like him the other day, or we ask them what stands out to his important problems. But the two key questions are these last two, where we ask people, what things do you think would help Farid? And this is where we find out. It's like mining for gold. It's where we find out from the service providers who do this work every day, what they do and what they know will work and does help people like Farid. And then, as I said, this is a composite. There are many people in this uh, this cluster that have similar challenges to Farid. So we need to think about what is it that health services and communities do to help people like Farid. So from that, we found lots of ideas. So this is from one of the action learning workshops where we talked about Farid and we generated ideas. The thing to remember is that we've got at least 50 of these vignettes that we've developed. And on average, we've got seven to 10 action ideas for each one of these vignettes. That's 350 to 500 ideas that were generated within this project. So you can see that's why I get a bit lost for words. We say, what did you find? We found lots. Um, and the, in the report, you'll see that these, these ideas have been themed into these kind of these, I, these areas. So around connection and referral to services, building relationships between residents, proprietors and landlords, the provision of information about health and social services, 
digital inclusion and social connection. You can also start to see how these then are brought forward into the recommendations. So these are action ideas, some of them are things that are already happening in practice. So it's building on what's already good. And some of them are new ideas that have emerged from these insights and the lessons from data analysis and experience in the field. So the idea is that we can jump into the report and identify ideas for future action and importantly, co-design. We have to work with our communities to, in order to, to create initiatives that, that are not one size fits all, that they're fit for purpose. So the recommendations then, as you say, were formulated from all of these things, the health literacy profiles, all of the socio-demographic and other characteristics, the interviews, the interviewer observations and these action learning workshops. So there's a lot that sits behind the recommendations. So there are eight of them. I'm just going to go through a couple of them to highlight particular areas of, of interest in each. So the first one is around health literacy responsiveness. And this is about making the health sector friendlier and easier to access. So making it easier for people to find the information that they need. So sometimes this might be about partnering with diverse stakeholders and agencies, like people outside of health. So it might be libraries or community hubs. So we can support those active linkages and strategies to help people find information. Thinking about a warm referral. So this is where uh, it's not like a cold call, it's where we do things to increase the likelihood that people will actually make it to that first appointment. One of the big achievements of Hurrah and the way that they worked was around proactively engaging with people. We call this assertive outreach or, or inreach. It's actually taking the the connection to the doorstep, to the doorstep, literally. Um, it may not always be appropriate to do door knocking, but, but taking healthcare to people and helping them to find you. But also that requires training so that people know how to work with people experiencing these kinds of vulnerabilities and disadvantages that we've described. Number three is more like a wraparound, having multidisciplinary intersexual approaches to care. So how can we take things like resource health hubs and uh, pop-up health clinics to where people live, but making sure that we've got multiple service providers there who can respond to all of those support needs. So you know, it might be financial counselling, it might be chronic health conditions, it might be other things related to mental health, etc. All of those you know, the physical, mental health, social and all those circumstances bring them together. Service navigation is so key. It's about taking that no, no wrong door approach. So, you know, we heard stories of you know, where people sometimes will go to emergency food relief, for example, fairly frequently as a, a way of managing their budget. But imagine if the person who greets them at the emergency food relief noticed that or was able to then say, ask if they needed that support around about financial counselling or other services, et cetera. So there's, it doesn't matter which door pe people walk through, they've always come to the right place. So it's important to think about that more holistically. With continuity of care, uh, the programs we often design are too short. You know, by the time you've developed that communication, trust and rapport, the, the, the programs fit program's finished. So we need to have a longer, more ongoing continuity of support or longer programs or things that help people through those periods when their attendance is going to be less frequent or sporadic or interrupted because daily life gets in the way. Did your inclusion, big one. I'm sorry some of you experienced that at the beginning of this seminar, but it, it, it's a big one about, we, we need to continue to understand and advocate for digital inclusion and digital health literacy. That ideas around co-design are so important in this setting to make sure we do things that are fit for purpose. Creating spaces and opportunity to develop capability and capacity. And most of all, make sure that services can be accessed without reliance on digital technology. So social connection, all of our three speakers today, we heard from the residents talked about the importance of social connection look for new opportunities uh, to create it to, and make people feel safe about connecting again. And the final recommendation 
is where we started. And the final recommendation is, is about using this report and all of its contents, all of the bits and pieces of information and knowledge insights that we've gathered to develop and implement training and quality improvements for all of your Victorian community health services to make sure that you can optimise your reach and service provision. So that's a quick trip through the report and I'm hoping that those snippets of information um, have quenched your appetite to read it, for one, and two, will help you to navigate your way through it and to find the information that you need to start informing how you might design your services and programs going forward. So I'm really happy to take questions and feedback. So I'll stop sharing my screen now and hand over to our question and answer. Thanks, Shandell. That was great information. Um, wonderful to have some recommendations that might help us about where, where to go next. How do we start? How do we translate this into action at an individual health service perspective, but also from a policy perspective? Uh, and then from that funded programs that are long-term rather than short-term to continue such very important work about giving access to our vulnerable members of the community. Um, to information, to support, to allow them to live their best lives that they're able to. I'd like to introduce the members of our Q&A panel now. We have Ranjit from uh, Swinburne. We have Sally from Connect Health and Community. We have Linda and um, Alice, a big pattern, from Star Health. We have Ian from Peninsula Health, Nisa from Mary and Kay from Bendigo. And they're going to uh, manage the questions that no doubt um, you have been sitting there through the presentation today and are really wanting to answer. So I will pass that over um, to Ranjit and Sally. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, perhaps we start by a first question, which is more a practical perspective of uh, where we've come from. And the question is, within health services provider catchments, what new practices has this research been able to influence? Perhaps we could start with Nisa and work through the panel in terms of how you see this influencing actions at a local level. Thanks, Ranjit and team. Um, so it's been quite interesting being part of this project because we were able to get the learnings live as we were getting the data. So that allowed, first of all, the learnings to change the scope of the hurrah programs for us in terms of understanding and readjusting the ways that we were getting out health information to people living in those various settings. Um, it also allowed us um, to figure out different ways of engagement and that regardless of the fact that they may all live in community housing, that that wasn't a one size fits all approach. We needed different mechanisms of reaching all of those community cohorts living in that environment. Uh, beyond Hurrah, we participated with a broad number of our staff across a variety of program areas in our organisation uh, from age to uh, family and community services and uh, were able to give them an insight into the vignettes and to get insight into the health literacy challenges and also the digital divide that we're currently managing. Uh, that assisted us greatly across a variety of program areas in readjusting how we responded to the pandemic in that in and out of lockdown and being able to really co-design with the consumers themselves what the provision of service was available to them where we couldn't provide that service in a face-to-face -face offering in a safe manner. It also still today continues in the fact that for those people that need to isolate because their household contacts and or they've got COVID themselves, that our clinicians are able to co-design with them an opportunity that they can still engage in the health or social support service by using some of the learnings uh, from this project. We also would really like to see um, further advocacy, which we have been involved in with our, our colleagues uh, from this research project in broader um, hurrah, but also in the planning and design of future programs uh, for our organisation and others in how we can take on these learnings. They're really like eight tangible actions that you should always have 
first and foremost in redesigning a service or in evaluating an existing service to make it better uh, for the community. And I'll pass on to my colleagues. Thanks, Nisa. Ian, I wonder whether you want to add to that. Thanks, Randy. Um, I think Nessa sort of covered it off quite well. I think particularly at health services, um, you know, obviously we were going through fairly significant redesign of services to meet the changing needs of our patients in our community um, as a result of the COVID pandemic. And um, part of that obviously is working with the, the communities that live and reside in these um, environments of, you know, high risk. And, um, you know, we did a lot of work in the um, supportive residential services. Our, we had the, the low rise, um, low rise public housing as well as um, they rise high density community housing and caravan parks. And you know, the the the, the, the residents um, were quite broad as, as the Shandell as far that their needs were quite broad as Shandell sort of indicated through the research. And I think as an organization, you know, part of it, you know, that we on reflection and as a necessary part of action and learning, it's not just about building the, the capability and capacity within the organization. So it's building a you know, particularly skilled workforce which is agile and flexible. Um, to be able to respond to patient sort of needs and that, that aligns you also with the, the flexibility of the funding that we receive that building sort of an agile flexible service um, but it's also building capacity and capability with the with the residents and um, you know so where we there's a lot of work that was uh, part of the enga link, engagement and linkage is part of the Harare initiative it's very much building that capacity and capability with residents and working at working at where they are in part of their journey. So for us, you know, it's not about just going in and, and pushing vaccination or pushing mask wearing or hand hygiene in, in relationship to COVID pandemic response. When if you reflect on sort of Maslow's hierarchy, if their basic needs around food, nutrition, safety, security, a roof over their head, you know, their their needs are quite significant and they're not going to take any sort of health messaging on at that point until we can address some of the you know, primary or basic needs of these residents. It's just building engagement relationship and rapport and learning that you know this doesn't happen with a quick one, you know, one off visit in and out. It's about building those long-term relationships and trust and respect. And then you can start to have these conversations around, you know, private safety and understanding around. You know, the, the importance of vaccination or the importance of um, the importance of hand hygiene or mask wearing at the time. So, you know, it is really that reflection and the action learning process has really tried to ensure that we were we as a service were agile and flexible enough to continue to change the way we, we, we provided services and supports to these residents as we learned more from the residents with that sort of co-design approach. And I want to thank you know working with some um, Springburn and the academic team out there, and I think it's been a great partnership between academia, health services, and our community to really think about how services can and should be delivered for these vulnerable communities. Thanks, Thanks Ian. Thank you for your insights on that. There is a question. Uh, one of the key features of this study has been to bring uh, regional presence and regional voice. Uh, this probably is for Kay. Uh, what, if any, has there been uh, in terms of impact and influence on regional Victoria with regards to this study and the uh, defunction financing of RAP? Uh, thank you, Ranjit. Um, and thanks for the question. Look, it really does emphasize pandemic there's not many silver linings but one of them is certainly participation in this research and from a regional perspective it really reinforces the fact that one size does not fit all and if you think about the geographical spread of of the hurrah work that we were doing across bendigo Loddon, often in small towns there were six to ten low-rise public housing units no gps a great expectation that there was digital literacy that people could participate in telehealth, that they understood how to register their positive um, test, et cetera. So I think the, the, the poor digital literacy and expectations of digital literacy for building health literacy and access to services 
is, you know, exacerbated, the issues are exacerbated with the, the regional, um, regional impacts. The other, I guess the other um, would be that, you know, antisocial behaviours and, and the things that we describe and we found in the research, for, for people living in social housing in uh, regional areas, sometimes there's no getting away from clusters of, of these behaviours. There's no anonymity. Um, and so the importance of understanding community, people's backstories, using local trusted champions, authentic co-design of messaging, building the capacity of service providers to understand their communities and understand that they simply cannot uh, use technology and that some of the things that we experimented with both in small regional towns and in suburbs of Bendigo was utilising the corner store as a key engagement. The corner store Facebook was a key engagement strategy for an area in Bendigo, a suburb in Eagle Hawk, where their, their Facebook was very important to that community of about 100 um, low rise. And so the, the person behind the counter in the corner store was the key person. These people don't go to the library or to the community health centre around the corner. We took the services to them. So from a regional perspective, um, there, there are additional implications for this research that's been an absolute privilege to be part of. Thanks, Kay. Uh, I may have to bring Linda in. This is a question from William McKenzie. Uh, Linda, the question is, as a public housing tenant living in Albert Park high rise, I would have liked the Hurrah program extended beyond June. We still had a lot of deaths from COVID and new strains coupled with seasonal flu made things very complicated. Is there a contingency plan to reactivate Hurrah if we have to go through a major pandemic in the future? Thanks, William. That's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Look, luckily, the Victorian government has invested $3.9 million in supporting a multicultural employment opportunities um, for people, for job seekers in the community. So Star Health will be actively involved with what we're calling the Community Connector Program. And that program is really around employing lived experience, people who, who are living in social housing, tra providing training, ongoing support, and the end result is providing those community hubs similar to what Hurrah did um, with the support of community programs and providing the social interaction the um, health access service that, that Hurrah did. But also we, we do have a, a beautiful program in Star Health, our older persons high rise, we call it, um, who have been really actively engaging our residents in digital literacy. And we've recently purchased, I think it's about 10 iPads. Um, and we are starting those you know, social kind of groups with the tenants in the social housing and teaching them how to, you know, navigate their way through digital access and accessing health services. So the Community Connectors program will be really important and it will, it won't replicate Hurrah, but it will certainly provide that ongoing support that we hope, you know, will meet the needs of our, of our tenants and residents. Thanks, Linda. Uh, here's a one uh, interesting question on the research process and the use of vignettes, and perhaps we have to bring Chandel into this. Uh, Chandel, the question is, do you see the vignettes for cluster profiles have a broader remit or use in other emergencies? For example, how could we use these profiles in preparing communities for other classes of emergencies? Do you want to take that one? Sure, thanks, Ranjit. Uh, thanks, Marin, for your question. And you're yeah, absolutely on the money, Marin. It's really these vignettes and the health literacy profiles are, are not only relevant to this research. They have um, enduring qualities. We can use them going forward. They will be very important in terms of any future planning that's done. So we can think about, we know in 
for example, this area that people may be experiencing these challenges, therefore what are the best ways? So working through them in the way that I highlighted during the presentation in asking what works best and what helps people, these can, can be used for both planning services and it can also be used as a way of checking in. So if you're developing a service and thinking, okay, we've got this model, will this work for X, Y, Z? Or what would we need to change in order to meet the specific needs? So it is about building those fit for purpose, tailoring, targeted, uh, so that we can maintain community trust and connection. So yes, definitely, these are a resource for, for many, many uh, applications going forward for planning and service improvement and evaluation. Uh, thanks, Shanda. Sally, perhaps you want to add some of your thoughts to that? Yeah, yeah. And I think this is a demonstration of the, the power of the partnership and the power of the relationship. I think that um, um, we've got we've got a robust objective set of, set of data and it is about how do we translate it. And I think there's opportunities in our health promotion planning. You know, when we talk about this being broader than the learnings out of the pandemic, the, the issues about how people communicate and, and what's going to be effective can equally be applied to healthy eating, how people engage in physical activity, how we address um, harm from tobacco, for example. I think there's a really interesting opportunity to, to think about how we use the research in, in the planning with our local public health units at the moment. Um, and one of the things that I would love to see, um, and I think for me, you know, it, it is part of the legacy of the work, but also the translation of the work into practice, is about thinking about how we use the work in the rollout of the Community Connectors program. And in the, um, particularly in the mobile, the mobile Community Connectors space, where you know, we know the expressions of interest have just, um, just been submitted. But I think there's some really fascinating opportunities for us to, to make the impact of this research um, go beyond what the a simple research study and and you know some lessons learned I guess. Thanks, Sally. Yes, there's there is longer term uh, impact coming. Are there was Jack Redditch? I can't see you, so my apologies. But you've had your hand up. Would you like to ask the question, Jackie? You're there. Jackie is not there. Let me go on to the next question. This is from Tim McCarthy. Uh, and anyone in the panel, feel free to take this one. Given that resources are always limited, cost efficiency and effectiveness will always be important. What measures are envisaged to measure social human costs? Who wants to take it? Nisa. Look, I think that's a very important question and one that community health is always challenged with. Social issues are really hard um, to measure because it's usually a longitudinal um, impact that you have rather than a short-term uh, impact. But that is something that this research can help us with in terms of the measurements that we used around health literacy and worries and being having the opportunity to potentially use components of that um, questions in re-evaluating with uh, a cohort of the community that we're servicing to see whether there's an improvement if we've had a focus on building health literacy or had a focus on improving uh, digital divide in being able to see that there's a movement um, and then that therefore would show and demonstrate an outcome as well as a social impact from the measures that we've put in place. Um, I know that there's a number of um, different community health that use different uh, measures as well and mechanisms in terms of uh, the experience um, as well as the outcomes of the consumers that we serve. And I'm going to also pass on to my colleagues, Sally, that can add to that. Yeah, thanks, Nisa. I think Tim's question is a really, really interesting one um, in terms of, you know, there's lots of discussion around measuring social impact at the moment. And I think it's an area that we're all starting to talk about and starting to turn our minds to. We've got the community health outcomes framework that's being implemented. We've got new outcomes framework in, um, in dental. We've got new outcomes frameworks coming through the Gambler's Help 
um, Foundation, for example. And I think that there's a really, again, it's another opportunity for us to actually stop and think about, as Nisa's saying, how do we measure both the benefits and the costs in terms of shifting our system from the way that it is at the moment to a system that is more engaging and co-designing with the residents who, who for whom the services are actually needed and reported. Thanks, Sally. Last question, and I, I, I could probably respond to this. How can we get access to the full report? Uh, there is a website and there is a report link. I have put placed the link to the report again on the chat, and each one of you will receive a email with the website address, perhaps by Friday, along with the questions that have not been taken. It's very close to the end, so let me pass this back to Amanda. Thank you. Thanks, Renji. And to our panelist members, thank you for your participation this morning. As you've heard, the research recommendations are achievable. We've collaborated in new research design methodologies that allowed us to translate research into practice in real time through the pandemic. We cannot go backwards from here. This research project has provided a platform for transformational change at every stage of service delivery. To lose this momentum now would be unforgivable. It's important to note that while the research was initially intended to inform service provision, communication and engagement during the COVID-19 pandemic, the findings and the recommendations can and should be applied broadly to improve health literacy and equity for residents of social housing in Victoria, beyond hurrah and beyond COVID. The significant health and social inequity experienced by people living in hurrah accommodation settings cannot be ignored. We recognise that this new evidence base has the potential to be a blueprint for building resident, community, organisational and system capability and capacity and the confidence to address these inequities and complex issues. On behalf of everyone here today, and particularly from a Connect Health and Community perspective, I'd like to thank um, Professor Richard Osborne, Dr Shandell Elmer and Ranjit from the team at Swinburne for their commitment and passion in helping us tell the resident stories. Who would have thought that we would see a research team in the field at the heart of a pandemic in full PPE? I'd like to thank uh, Penny Anderson as Director of Programs in the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing for her support along this sometimes complex journey. Special mention goes to the Research Project Advisory Group, many of them who have been on our Q&A panel this morning, who co-designed the research project with the Swingburn team, shared their experiences and their strategies, validated the data as the researchers provided live access to local data, while seconding staff into the research team, coordinating interviews and workshops with residents and staff, all at the height of the pandemic. To Alice, uh, and to Linda, to Nisa, to Kay, to Ian, <clears throat> Tony, Ian Simons and Sally, thank you. Your enthusiasm and insights have been invaluable. To Georgie, Stephen and Raf, and all of the 865 residents who participated in this research, my deepest thank you for your contribution. I hope that we've done you proud. We've endeavoured to remain authentic in the telling of the stories warts and all. As defined by the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing, our goal remains unchanged. The experience of residents will be heard and acknowledged with a focus on repair and healing. Communities will be, will be supported to recover, recognising the ongoing impact of the stress and disruption the pandemic has caused. We hope that this new evidence and model of collaborative research will help you as we look at new ways of collaborating and designing strategies to better support residents in vulnerable communities. Once again, on behalf of all of the participants this morning and for your contribution um, as guests to our session, I hope that you found the morning both insightful and that you walk away and as you get on with your busy day, you're charged with a high level of enthusiasm to do something about this important research findings. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and stay well. Bye-bye.